But it could be a powerful Leviathan without that. It would just have to be very vicious. Yeah. 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 He's politically incorrect. So the question is a good question. She said she had this problem reading it because, as you, as this discussion, the live the civilizing process. I'm sorry, your name. I, I, I read. I read. Said you know, she's reading the civilizing process. It really makes it sound like these medieval societies or even lesser developed societies today, outside of let's say the Western world, are somehow less developed, inferior. It isn't that a problem. Let me take this point of view for a bit. It's only a problem if you don't believe his data. If you believe that these other societies actually have higher homicide rates, if you believe that his data is correct, then what's your problem? Your problem is you don't like the results. Your problem is to say, well, yeah, I don't like cancer either, but when I get it, I realize it's there. I don't say, I'm not going to buy that analysis because I don't like cancer. He's saying, oh, these societies around the world, societies that Europe, that's why it's important that he talks about medieval Europe, because that gets him out of the charge of being a white racist. Right? Because he's only going to talk about how vicious the Africans are to each other, or how even better when he talks about the Native Americans. Right? And he has these really juicy quotes from people who fought with them, who lived with them, who experienced their tender loving care. And you say, oh, of course. This is not dances with wolves. These guys were really mean, right? Or that island, that island that after the, this was really great. There was this island in the, uh, in the Indian Ocean that after the huge tsunami a couple of years ago, this island is filled with natives who are really vicious. Anybody who comes on this island, the natives immediately kill. And it even happened that a couple of drunken, like, you know, Indonesian sailors kind of, you know, got drunk, fell asleep in the boat, the boat washes up on shore, and they like killed them immediately. And they had to, like Indonesia or one of the countries had to send in like armored helicopters to get the bodies. And after the tsunami, the relief workers were greatly relieved when they flew the helicopters over the island and all they got arrows shot at them. Right? That, that's how I mean that's his description. Now I don't know what to say. He doesn't appear to be a racist in that. He says, says that all societies at lower levels of development are vicious and crude, and there's a lot of murder. Now, your point is you don't like it. His point is that, okay, so what if you don't like it? Who cares whether you like it? His point is that's the way it is. You want to argue with them? Argue on empirical grounds. Don't argue on, like, you don't like the results. That's what he would say. It's not what I'm saying. I'm neutral with this. I don't have a dog in the hunt. Can I move on? Yeah. smaller population so that we killed someone it led to a much larger percentage of people dying. Yes, that's his point. That's what he says you should measure. If you're in any given society, you want to know not what the absolute murder rate is, you want to know what are my odds of being murdered. I want to know what are my odds. And he says in all of human history, the lowest odds of being murdered are in Western Europe since World War II. That's the lowest odds. It's one in 100,000 or something like that. And in the United States, it's like double. You're 2.3 or whatever. It's bad. But when you go to like any other societies, right, it jumps up to like, you know, 15 or the really vicious ones, like 45 per 100,000. Literally 45 times is more deadly in Papua New Guinea as it is in, in Sweden or whatever. That's what he's saying. So yeah, you're right. 
But that's his point. That's what he says you should be measuring. You should be measuring the overall number of deaths. Because that's, that doesn't tell you what your odds are. You want to know as a person, if I'm I living in a violent society, how would I know whether I was living in a violent society? Well, one of the things you might want to ask yourself is what are your odds of getting killed? That might be the question I would ask. It's not a stupid question. It's a good question. I hate this. I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm doing the prestigious jerk thing in order to get your attention. You have to actually decide for yourselves how much of an asshole I actually am. I leave that up to you. Let me move on. Because I'm trying to see what you got here. 115. I got 45 minutes. But I'm easily going to get through this. I want to give you an example that speaks to some of these themes. And it's research that I've been doing over the last seven or eight years. It starts in World War II, Operation Barbarossa, Operation Redbeard, when the Germans invade the Soviet Union on June 22, 1941. They rolled through quickly. In approximately 300 out of 3,000 cities, and I'm going to show you the region that we're talking about. In a pretty big area, running all the way from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea, so about a 1,500 mile area, the locals violently turned on the local Jewish population, whether they're local Lithuanians, Belarusians, Ukrainians, Romanians, Poles, and they carry out massacres of various kinds. These are often called, often called from the, the Russian word pogrom. Basically means an ethnic riot. Pogrom. This occurs, I, got, I need to give you a feel for this. This occurs in a one-month period between June 22nd and the end of July, when the Germans go through very quickly. Because the Germans are trying to capture the flag in Moscow. They're trying to go as fast as they can. And they basically leave it up to the locals. As you'll see, they say, do whatever you want to do. And in about 10% of places, they do the worst. There's no state authority. There's no nothing. So this is the war. This is a Hobbesian situation. Examples, the most famous is, is the city, because there's an entire book written about it called Neighbors, uh, the city in Bavnek in uh, northeastern Poland, where, in the words of the author Jan Gross, who wrote the book, says, half the town killed the other half of the town. They basically beat the Jews, marched them through the streets, stuffed them in a barn, and set the barn on fire. Of course, we have pictures of pogroms. Lvov, Ukraine, July 1941. Those are Ukrainians behind her chasing. You can actually see that a pogrom can entail sexual violence as well. We have multiple testimonies of this. Yashin, Romania. June 28, 1941. A pogrom, several thousand are killed. And of course, perhaps the most famous, the Kovno Garage Massacre in Lithuania, June 27, 1941. Yes, you're seeing this correctly, my friends. That is a guy with a metal club, or it's actually, we think it's a metal pipe, who systematically beats 50 people to death while Lithuanian, that guy there's a Lithuanian partisan soldier, stands around, a few Germans. What you don't see here, because we have a testimony, this was taken by a German soldier, this photo. Um, what you don't see here is that there were parents holding their kids up to see what was going on. And afterwards, when it's all over, this guy stops, he grabs an accordion and plays the national anthem. It's a festive atmosphere. It's a kind of a fun thing they're doing. Why? 
Remember, it only happens in 10% of places. Now, this should not be all that surprising. We know, for example, that the vast majority of communities in the American South after the end of slavery, there was no religion. Lynching was a minority phenomenon, but it happened in some places. Why were some communities toxic but others benign? Why do pogroms occur in some locations but not in others? Violence may be a factor, but it's not a universal factor. That's my first question in the picture. You'll see I, I get a little more of this. I want to ask, what kinds of places were these? Did they share characteristics? Was there was a certain commonality among them. Did they systematically differ? Did pogrom locations systematically differ from non-pogrom locations? We want to know that. That's one thing we as social scientists can do. Remember, the Holocaust has yet to occur. The decision on the final solution to the Jewish question would not occur for another year. The Germans didn't quite know what they were doing yet. The mass killings would not occur for another two months. When the SS comes back, the SS comes back and they start massacring people in open pits. So what are the conventional explanations out there? Well, of course, the Germans. The Germans, of course, this only happens once the Germans invade. And indeed, this guy who was the head of the SS, Reinhard Heydrich, who incidentally is assassinated um, uh, uh, basically a year and a bit later in, in Czechoslovakia, he says, and I quote, these, he has these, these mobile killing units that you may have heard of, the Einsatzgruppen, and he says, nothing is to be put in the way of the self-cleansing actions of anti-communist and anti-Jewish circles in the newly occupied areas. On the contrary, without a trace, they are to be unleashed and, when necessary, intensified. That would tell you what the Germans wanted is they wanted the locals to do their dirty work for them. And were it not for the Germans, this wouldn't have happened. The Germans created the lawless atmosphere in which this could happen. I agree. I agree. However, this is an incomplete explanation. Why? Just based on what I've told you already, how do we know it's not a proper explanation? What? Sorry, in only 10% of cities that actually happens, so yes. why the other cities? Yes, exactly. I like, you're a good social scientist. Exactly the point. It only happens in 10% of places, but the Germans were everywhere. And in fact, in many places we have German testimony, they're very frustrated. They can't get the locals to do it. It's hard to get people to do this. Under most circumstances, it's hard. Germans are everywhere, but it only happens in some places. So while the Germans may have been a necessary condition, go do it. It was not sufficient. Next. It might interest you to know that everywhere this happened, everywhere, the Soviet Union had occupied these territories from 1939 to 1941. They split it up in a deal with Hitler, the famous Hitler-Stalin pact. They divided up Europe, Eastern Europe, and these areas all became part of the Soviet Union. It is interesting to note that no pogroms happened in the German areas. In the German areas. And no pogroms happened in the old Soviet Union. The pre-39 Soviet Union. There was something about the Soviet occupation that clearly made matters worse. We know this is the case. One of the most important things is that, whereas, for example, in Poland, in Poland, Previous to 39, the Poles were on top of the hierarchy. Ukrainians and Jews were below. Good jobs were reserved for Poles. Clearly, what happens is when the Soviets come in, they overturn that ethnic hierarchy. Anybody can hold any job. That's not to say that Soviet rule is nice. It wasn't nice. 
In fact, we know that in the days before the Soviets leave, as the Soviets are about to leave when the Germans invade June 22, 1941, Soviet secret police prisons that were packed full of Ukrainian nationalists who wanted an independent Ukraine, the NKVD, which is the forerunner of the KGB, Stalin gave orders to massacre them all to kill them all in the prisons. The Germans show up and they say, oh, look at all these corpses. And there are thousands of corpses in NKVD prisons. And they turn to the local population and they say, look and see what the Jews did. Don't you want revenge? And indeed, in those communities, there were pogroms. Here's the problem. It's similar to the problem that you pointed out before. The Soviets were everywhere. They were everywhere. There were only 300 pogroms. There's no evidence that Soviet rule was any worse where pogroms happened from where they did not happen. In fact, the map of pogrom locations, which I don't have here, and I could put here, the map of pogrom locations that I've established, there are far more pogroms than NKVD prisons. So while that May, well, the NKVD prisons may have made the pogroms worse. In fact, there were pogroms where there were no NKVD massacres at all. Which tells you that while the Soviet occupation itself, like the German occupation, may have been a necessary condition, their withdrawal and the terror that they wreaked upon these societies was not a sufficient condition. See what I'm saying? How about nationalism and anti-Semitism? Here, here you have two of my favorite people. The anti-Semite Stepan Bandera, the Ukrainian nationalist who headed the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, founded in Vienna in 1929, hated Poles, hated Jews, wanted to have a free Ukraine, made an alliance with the Germans, who told them, look, if you guys help us invade, we're going to give you your own state. The Germans lie. They don't give them their own state. In fact, they end up imprisoning Bandera. They don't kill him. He ends up living, actually, until 1959, where he gets killed in, in of Munich after World War II. Uh, he dies by a, a, a KGB hitman, kills him in 1959. Roman Tomowski, Polish, head of the National Democrats in Poland, the National Divisne, National Democrats, who are, are also a deeply anti-Semitic party. The argument here would be, where the nationalists are stronger, you would expect there to be more pogroms, right? Where the guys who hated Jews were more strong, you should get a pogrom. <laughs> Okay, so let's test it all. How do I test it? Well, I do something really simple. I ask what kind of communities are, are these? Did pogrom and non-pogrom locations differ in systematic ways? How can we know? I use the basic toolbox of social science. Essentially what I've done is I've gathered all voting data and all census data on every village in Eastern Europe. Just cost you and your parents a couple several hundred thousand dollars. That's cool. <laughs> and then I matched them up on whether pogroms did or didn't happen. So this is a map of interwar of pre-World War II Poland. That's basically the area of the Soviet takeover. So all that part of Poland, all of, these are the pueblo chips, they're like provinces. I'm going to show you some data just on this area here. The Bialystok and Polesi Voivo ships. Northeastern Poland, where the main groups are Poles, Jews, and Belarusians. So, let me just walk you through this. It's going to make you nervous, I realize. This is data. I simply divided up the communities. 
That is, if you go to the very bottom, you'll see the number. 56 communities where you've had pogroms, and 296 communities where you did not have pogroms, in the northeastern part of Poland. And I looked at basically two sets of factors. Demographic and political. So you need to know a little something about that. You don't need to write these down. There were two censuses in Poland. That is, how do we know how many Jews, how many Catholics, how many Poles, how many yada 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 lived in every village? They did that twice, in 1921 and 1931. They were going to do one in 1941, of course the Germans ran on that parade by a day. There were elections in Poland, two basically free and fair ones, in 1922 and 1928. After that, they're kind of not so free and fair. So I, I have, I have both, I know who lived in these villages and what the politics were like in these villages. Are there systematic differences? The answer, just looking at this, is yes. What are those systematic differences? Let's look at the numbers, the demographics. It's very important to note, this is the most obvious, the second line, that in those locations where there were pogroms, there were lots of Jews. Not only in absolute terms, these are the mediums. Everybody here knows what a median is? That's the 50% mark of the data. It's like an average, but it's not really. You should have learned this in high school. <laughs> Mean, median, and mode, remember all that? Organizing data. I my son said that in grade six. Okay. So, what it shows you first here is that those areas where they had pogroms both had a lot of Jews, more Jews, and a larger percentage of Jews. And in those places with no pogroms, you have less Jews. Now, on the one hand, this is not a very surprising result. This goes under the category of the, right? Any good self-respecting violent pogromist would go where the customers were, right? You want to kill them where they are, not where they aren't. But this isn't so simple, my friends, because in fact, if you were really worried that there would be resistance, you would likely kill them where there were fewer of them, where you outnumbered them. So I'm not sure exactly what to make of that, but it strikes me that there's a larger story here about the kinds of communities where Jews were likely to receive the minimal possible respect. Not love, not love, but the minimal solidarity. That was the kind when, when things got bad, said, look, we may not like them either, but you don't kill them. The second line here, the second set of variables here, uh, are very interesting. These are voting, this is the voting material, voting data. And I want to point to four kinds of parties. The first is, the first party are the religious Jews, the Agudas Israel. These are the kinds of Jews you see when you drive up Bathurst, like Bathurst and Lawrence. Right, you guys wearing the black hats and stuff like that. It wasn't just that, it also tended to be market, you know, um, um, also some modern Orthodox, but they tended to be very devout, very pious. And indeed, there is a small difference. Where they're visible, because they're very visible, these kinds of Jews, right? You can easily spot them. There is a small difference, but not as big as I thought they would be. That was my original hypothesis. I thought that where the Jews were most visible, that's where they would get killed. It's not so much of a difference. Let's go to the third line. Polish nationalists. That's the immediate vote for the Polish nationalists in 1928. Indeed, there is a difference. There is a difference. That is, where the Polish nationalists were stronger, you were more likely to get a pogrom. It's not as big as I thought it would be, though. That was my other hypothesis. I really wanted to say, oh, yeah, straightforward. Where you had anti-Semitism, that's where you would get pogroms. In fact, that wasn't the case. It's very small, the difference. 
In fact, over this large number, it's not statistically significant. Two factors I want to point to here. The first, the slide number two here, the Zionist vote, 1928. Look at that difference. It's a 22 times difference. That is to say, in those places, now the question is, what was Zionism at this point? What was Zionism? It's an interesting question. There was no Israel. Israel, remember this is 1928, Israel would not exist for another 20 years. Nor was it even a desire to move to Palestine. Because why? You couldn't. You could not. It was closed. There was a trickle. A couple thousand a year were allowed to move. The British had closed it off because they were worried about Arab public opinion. Well, reasonable enough. They were worried about it. They, so they closed off. You couldn't leave. What did it mean to be a Zionist? And you weren't leaving. Did it mean to speak Hebrew? No. Most, the vast majority of these people spoke no Hebrew. Zionists in Poland in 1928 dreamed of Zionism in Polish and Yiddish. That was their language. Okay, so it wasn't that either. So what was it? What is Zionism? It's an interesting question. It's an interesting question. Zionism, I would argue, I would argue, at this point in time, is simply a form of modern Jewish nationalism. Modern Jewish nationalism. In the same way that there's French nationalism, there's Italian nationalism, today there's Palestinian nationalism. It's nationalism. It's the belief that you are of an ethnic national group that should have your rights as group rights, like the French in Quebec, respected. And what's more, they were quite aggressive about it. What do I mean by aggressive? I don't mean they had guns. They had no guns. I mean, they were elected to parliament. With that kind of vote, they had huge numbers of parliamentarians. There were lots of Jewish members of parliament. And they would get up there in parliament and say, you can say quite fluent, unaccented Polish. You guys are discriminating against us. We want to have, you guys make uh, a Sunday a day of rest and our shops have to be closed, but that discriminates against us because we have to close our shops on Saturday because that's our day of rest. So in fact, we have to close our shops two days a week. You guys only have to close them one day a week. You guys are banning kosher butchering, like, like what the Muslims call halal, right? Kosher butchering on, on saying it's, it's inhumanitarian to the animals. When in fact we know what it is, it's an attempt to grab the meat market by, by non-Jewish butchers. You create quotas at universities, you have ghetto benches at universities, you don't allow any Jews in the civil service, we want equality of rights, and what's more, we want our schools, either in Hebrew or in Yiddish, or religious schools, funded by the state, as you guarantee when you signed the Minorities Treaty in 1919 when Poland became an independent state, and you lied. They said this all the problem. At that point, the Poles said to themselves, you know what? These guys don't want to be part of the Polish nation. They're not really Poles. They think of themselves as Jews. And I would argue that this led to a loss. It's not, I'm not saying the Jews didn't have the right to articulate their own nation-building project. They had just as much a right as any other group, as the Poles themselves. But what this led to was a loss in solidarity by their fellow Poles at the village level. And in those areas where the Jews articulated and strongly articulated and supported their own nation-building project, there was not the bare minimum of solidarity that was needed to prevent the worst when a Hobbesian or a Thucydides-like situation came around. You understand where I'm going with this? So where did pogroms occur? They occur where there are lots of Jews, and where they constitute a large percentage of the local population, where they're unwilling to integrate into the dominant nation-building project. So I, I'm agreeing with Pinker 
And I'm agreeing with Lucidity's that a Hobbesian situation 